<coughs> the Pasha of the week is, of course, Pasha's Chukas. We all know what Chuko is. We discussed it here many times, and we all learned. And the word Chuko in the Torah is mentioned many times in association to many mitzvahs. And we know, generally speaking, that in the Torah, all the mitzvahs of the Torah fall into one of three categories, which are referred to as Eidois, which generally speaking means testimonials. Eidois, something like an aid, like a witness, something that attests to some historical occurrence, like Pesach, Shavuos, Sukkis, Shabbos is also an aid of the creation of the world. Then there are Mishpotim, which generally speaking refers to civil laws, laws that, that guide our behavior amongst ourselves. And these laws are called Mishpotim. And then there is Chukim. Chukim are generally loosely translated as decrees. A decree means a statement, a ruling that, that defines the way you behave regardless of how you understand it. And it is generally uh, explained that Mishkotim are in the category that lend themselves to be understood by the human mind, human logic, human rationale. Although I have to point out that when you go to learn any Mishpot, any aspect of the Mishpotim, any law that has is a civil law that has to do with simply don't steal, don't rob, even don't kill. All the various laws that are that are readily understood by the human mind, if you go deeply into them, a little further than the surface, you immediately can see that there are laws associated with them that do not fit into our logic. For instance, if you steal, if someone steals and he is caught, he has to pay double. Your way that's called kefir. If someone robs at gunpoint, all he has to do is return the object that he took. Can anyone explain that? They're all premeditated. Nobody picks out a gun accidentally, unintentionally. I'm not going into this. I'm just pointing out that the laws of the Torah are laws of the Torah, are godly laws. And no one is going to venture to say, well, I understand this law from top to bottom. It makes perfect sense. It fits completely in the human mind. Absolutely, there is no such thing. There is no such thing. Nevertheless, these are laws, two things. Number one, it makes sense that these laws should exist. You have to have laws that guide, that, that um, manage inter-human relations. And generally speaking, <coughs> the laws are, can be understood at least after they were given. We understand what it means to pay double. If the Torah said that if you steal, you have to stand on your head, then you'd say, I don't understand. What does that have to do with, with, with stealing? So generally speaking, we can relate to it. And the same thing is true regarding Eidois, the other category. These are 
generally are, are referred to as laws that we would not figure out on our own, would not have the basis to figure out on our own. But once they were prescribed in the Torah, we can relate to them, we can understand. And then there is Chukim. And the Chukim are laws that even after that they were described in the Torah, we do not have a handle on them to be able to, to put it into, into logic, in human intelligence. In this category fall all the laws of Chukim, like Shatnez. Shatnez is a law that you're not allowed to mix in the same garment wool and linen. Now, wool and linen, there are two different different sources. Wool comes from a sheep, from a living uh, a living animal. Linen comes from the ground. But how is the wool and linen hurt, and how is a human being affected by mixing it or not mixing it? We don't have a way to to really explain it. And as a matter of fact, you're allowed to wear wool and linen but in two separate garments. It's just that they are joined in the same garment, you know, and that really, we, can be, we don't have a handle on to explain. The same go, goes for many of the dietary laws, mixing milk and, and meat is also a hookah that we, we don't really have a handle way to explain. Certain, uh, certain animals are prohibited. The Torah says the animals that you're allowed to eat uh, split their hoofs and chew their cud. Anybody knows what that means? Maligator and, and... Okay. How that affects the animal, what that means as far as we're concerned, we don't know. So, uh, did you say all of Kashi's is a uh, hookah? Generally speaking, yes. All of Kasu's and Kuala I'll delve into it a little bit deeper in a moment. I don't want to get you off track, but I remember we actually spoke about this once in Yeshiva that the meat, I mean, what about the fact that we say, like, maybe like the, the, the function to which the, the, the people works, we don't understand. But like we say, like, why do we keep kosher? Because certain animals have sparks. And it's far. Certain animals have an aspect of fiducia in them, which we're able to elevate, and others do not. So why can't we say, I mean, can we say that that is a reason? I mean, why is it a reason? It absolutely is a reason. And I'll tell you something, there's probably more, more reason than, than we can even begin to imagine. But does that reason fit into normal human thinking? That's called, you know, I, as far as this reason is concerned, any, not any better in terms of reason than saying, oh, the Hashem said we shouldn't do it. Of course you shouldn't do it. Right? It's, not, it's a different, different level like, of a reason. Not human reason. No. Right. It's not a reason of, of uh, so to speak, human logic. Actually, there is a fourth category. And that fourth category is what this, what our past talks about. This is Poraduma. And it's also called a Chuko. But this Chuko is in a category by itself. And relative to this Chuko, we, we actually put the other mitzvahs slightly differently. There we put if we want to put, still maintain, so to speak, three categories, we would say that Eidois and Mishpotim go into one category because we can grasp it with our human mind. Chukim are such things that we cannot grasp with our human mind, but we can describe what it is that we are doing. We say, don't mix meat and milk. So we cannot explain the reason for it, but nevertheless we can we can point to the fact that these are completely different natures. 
milk and, and, and meat. We can point to the fact that wool and, and linen are also different sources, very different. There is something to, to grab onto. And as you said also, in terms of, of um, laws of cashews, certain animals we should not eat, the Mephoshim, they even and, 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 and point out that the food that we eat, that becomes part of our bloodstream and ultimately it affects our nature. And when you eat meat from an animal that has a vicious nature, that also distorts human nature. It runs in, it runs in impure, like if you eat a chazer, a lonely animal, or you eat um, an animal that's not kosher and has has uh, other um, negative inclinations and uh, natures. The Torah forbids us to eat birds, attack birds. And we can very readily say, oh, it makes sense, because they have that, that vicious nature. They attack animals that are, that, that that are on par with them, a similar level of life, and yet they attack them and eat them, so they have a vicious nature. So there is a way to relate to it, not fully explain it, but some grasp. Then there is a category by itself, which is the ultimate of a chukka, and that's the poradum. Parah Duma, we all learned that Parah Duma is used to purify a person from Tumas Meis. Tumas Meis is the most severe Tuma that one can acquire by contact, by touching something. And every other Tuma lifts when you toil yourself in water. Now, toil in water, even though that also is a hookah, that you submerge yourself in water and you come out and you toil. Nevertheless, again, we have some way of relating to it. After all, water does cleanse, and when you submerge yourself in water, you submerge yourself in a cleanser. You come out, there's an aspect of, of, of Tahara. We can, we can relate to the idea. But for Aduma, it's a completely different thing. You take this red, red cow, cow, red hyphen, you burn it, you shaft it, you burn it to ashes. You take a drop of these ashes, put it into water, and the water has to be Maim Chaim. Maim Chaim means spring water, well water, not water from an accumulation from a lake, but a living water, what's called. And you take a little of this water and you, and with a, with a, with a grass, with a stick, you sprinkle one drop on this person and become storage. This, we have no, no grasp on. We have nothing to talk about. You can relate to it at all. And therefore, this is the real hookah. When the Torah introduces this mitzvah and says it's a chukah, this chukah is referred to not the chukah, this particular chukah, chukah's haporah, the chukah of the, of the, of the cow. It says chukah's hatoira. This is the chukah of the Torah, which means that even though we're talking about a specific Mitzvah, one from amongst all the others, and ultimately, this hookah is the basis, and it actually represents the very source of all other mitzvahs.
Chuk is not Torah. The Chuk of the Torah. So we want to discuss the concept of a chukah in a moment, and then come back to, to this Indian, and then in Mitzvah Shem we'll talk about ourselves. The word chukah means engraving. Engraving in contrast to writing on, with ink, ink on the parchment. So this is discussed all over that there are three ways that one can represent a, um, a thought, a Torah. One is by writing. In writing, you have a piece of parchment, you have ink, you apply the ink to the parchment. And this ink represents certain words and these words tell us about the mitzvah Shabbos, Kashas and all the other mitzvahs then there is another way that, that, this can, that this writing can be represented and that through engraving when you take a chisel and you cut out into the stone the letters that, that spell out this mitzvah. That's another way of writing. And there's a third way of writing where you engrave the letters into the stone but not that you just cut the, the letters on top of the stone. You cut the letters through and through the stone, all the way through, from one side to the other. And what is the difference, as far as the mitzvah is concerned, whether it's written, engraved, or cut in? The difference is that when you write it on the parchment, so even though now the parchment contains this mitzvah, you can still scratch it off because the ink that is on the parchment is after it, after it dries and after it sticks to the parchment it becomes one it's nearly not one they're two separate entities the parchment and the ink and you can still spring it off and it comes right off when you engrave lettering on a stone then there's no way for you to remove the letter you can't separate the letter from the stone if it's part in the stone, on the stone so even though it is part of the stone nevertheless you can still identify the lettering as something additional to the stone because how this lettering work, you cut it in, and therefore that part of the stone, where the letter, when you have this engraving, when you have this scratch, the stone is less bright, less shiny, more dull, and therefore you see the lettering. And thus, this lettering, even though it's part of the stone, but it is an additional part, it's something add on to the stone, it cannot be separated, but it but it's still an eno, an eno. But you cannot separate them. You cannot separate them, but you can identify them as, as in a as separate. Because they... There's a color, discoloration and so forth. I'm sure. Mm, right. It doesn't shine in the same way. And then when you have the lettering cut into the stone through and through, then in fact there is no no separate thing at all from the lettering in the stone. The stone is the letter. 
the stone is the better. These three ways of describing this writing correspond, as we shall see, to the three categories of mitzvahs that we have now discussed. All mitzvahs come from Hashem. They come from Hashem. And as such, they represent Hashem. We have a mitzvah, whether it's mitzvahs chukim, or redes, or mishpotim. The mitzvah represents Hashem. Why do we have the mitzvah? Because Hashem told us to do it. Every mitzvah. Nevertheless, there is a difference to what extent it is connected, it stays connected to Hashem. Like in the mitzvahs of mishpotim, mitzvahs that we can that we can elaborate on, that we can focus in and explain rationally, we can rationalize. Those mitzvahs, even though we know that Hashem gave us these mitzvahs, nevertheless, because we can rationalize them, in a certain sense, we can separate the, the mitzvah from Hashem. Say, so, oh, it makes sense to me. It exists as in something additional. Yes, Hashem told me to do it, but I also can relate to the mitzvah itself. I, and, and, and even to the extent that we have to be directed, we have to be warned, that especially, specifically, always remember that even the mitzvah of mishpotim is a command from Hashem. It's not just a rational thing. Why do we have to be told that? Because it's possible for a person to, to misunderstand and say, no, I don't need, I don't need it to be a command of Hashem. I can do it because of my own sake. This is like the letters that can be scraped off the, the parchment from their source and become a separate thing. Then there are the mitzvahs, like we said, the Eidois and the other chukim that we cannot really fully explain separately from from the from Hashem. We can we always have to relate that oh Hashem said it. But still we can after Hashem had said it we can have a handle on it. We can have a certain sense, a certain speculation. I see what it means. As a matter of fact, the Gemara tells us that Shloime HaMelech, who is described in the Tanakh, in the Torah, as being the Chochem Mikol Odom, Chochem Mikol Odom, Shloime HaMelech was granted a gift of wisdom above all other people, and he, with his Chochme, was able to understand the inside reason for all the mitzvahs, including the chuk. So in a certain sense, he was able to identify the mitzvah on the basis of reason, not just on the basis of the fact that Hashem gave it to us. Kind of separating, identifying the, the letters separate from the stone. Then there is the mitzvah of Poraduma. Poraduma is such a mitzvah that <laughs> does not have these, these handles whatsoever. It cannot, in, in any which way, be, be peeled off or identified separately from the stone. It is part of the stone. Pora Aduma exists exclusively, only because it says so in the Torah of Hashem said. Take it away from there, I don't have what to explain. I can I don't have a handle.
What is Por Adumo about? So we know what you have to do and we discussed before. It is to bring back a person who became Tomei. Tomei, you all know that what is the significance of being Tomei? Generally speaking, the meaning of being Tomei is that you're not allowed to go into the Vesamigdosh. You're not allowed to touch, to be associated with anything holy. Now, you can't go into Vesamigdosh, or nor can you eat anything holy. A Kohen who is Tome cannot eat Truma. A Yisrael who is Tome cannot eat Maisa Shani. I don't know if you're familiar with that. There's a certain food that's called Maisa Shani, a Thai, that they even have to take off from their produce that they have to take to Yerushalayim and eat it in Yerushalayim, and that also is holy. And when they are Tommy, you're not allowed to eat it. This is what Tommy is about. Which means that Tuma, in effect, denotes a separation between the Yid and Hashem. Otherwise, he can do everything. He can even do mitzvahs, he can daven, he can learn. But to go into the holy place, that is not allowed. From all tumors, from all categories of tumors, a person becomes Tomer. He emerges from that tumor by submerging himself in, in a mikra, in, in what? All except for this one of Thomas Mess. And the Gemara says that when Hashem told Moshe about the Thomas Mess, When Hashem told Moshe and Tumas Meis, so Moshe understood the depth of Tumas Meis. And he said, the Gemara says in his Karkemu Ponov, Moshe's face became distorted, contorted. He became dark with fear. How can he become Torah? Thomas Mess, how can he become Torah? And that's when Hashem gave him the mitzvah of Paul Adu. What's involved in this? all recognize that we live in this physical world even though we have souls we have neshamas but we are in a body we are in a body the body does not have a life of its own the body lives because there is a neshama in the body doesn't have a life of its own. This neshama that gives life to the body, this neshama is actually completely connected and one with Hashem. Like the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya, in the second page you all learned, mamush. It is one thing with Hashem. And thus, this neshama, the life that's in this neshama, is not something that is added to it. There's a neshama and also it has life, like a goof. There's a goof and it has life. No. The neshama is life in itself, through and through. It's, it's, a, it's a godly, it's part of God. It's a godly spark. 
The goof, on the other hand, does not have its own life. The goof has life as long as it is a receptacle, as long as it houses the Nishon. And thus we always mention, this is something which I mention all the time, but we can readily relate to this, that even though we have a goof, and the goof is a physical entity that can be hurt and can be damaged, nevertheless, we know that if we have a cut on our finger, and the finger, the two parts of the finger become two parts, separate, two physical parts. And yet we put a band-aid on it, we cover it. A few days later, the cut disappears like it never happened. It heals perfectly. Why does it heal perfectly? How does that happen? That happens because the neshama that's in this finger was not cut. The neshama cannot be cut. The finger was cut. But the neshama is still perfectly alive. And it's exactly the same neshama. And it exactly knows exactly what the finger is supposed to look like. And it directs the molecules to heal exactly the way it should. Because it stays alive. So as long as one, as the life is there, and the life, as we said before, the life is directly representative of Hashem, of Kedusha. So even if one is damaged, he becomes temporarily impure, we can understand how he can come back and become pure again. Because he is still associated with Hashem. Because there is still life in it. But when it comes to Tumas Mace, Mace represents the absence of Nishon, the absence of a godly spark, the absence of a godly presentation. This is possible in our world. How can you emerge from that type of tumor? There's nothing to salvage. There's no, there's no connection. There's no way to explain, so to speak, how you're going to get back. Like we said before, when there's a cut, we can explain how it heals, because the Rishon is still there. There's still life in it, still connection to Hashem, but here there is no connection. How is that going to happen? How is he going to emerge from this too? And for this came this mitzvah of Poradum. While we have no way to understand, and we said we have no handle on it at all, how we can possibly relate to this mitzvah in specifics. But one thing that this mitzvah says, the message that comes from this mitzvah is that even Tumas Meis can also become taught. Huh? Last question. Last question. Just one second. You can become toyed even from Tumas Smith. And how is that possible? What's the, how do we, what does that tell us? What's the message behind it? The message behind it is the principle of this chukah. The principle of the chukah is that even, like we said before, that there is this level of chukah, this level of engraving, of cutting into the stone, that you cannot separate the letter from the stone. 
which means that Hashem, that the connection between a yid and Hashem is such that even when you cannot discern, you cannot see at all any connection, it is still there. Why? Because this connection is engraved in the very mitzvahs of the person of the yid. Like lettering cut into the stone, not engraved on top. Engraved on top, you could still see it. Lettering that's cut right through and through the stone. You don't see anything. And yet, that's what it is. This is the, the, the so to speak, the secret that the Torah is revealing here. That Ayid, the Gemara says, Yisrael, Afal Pisha Chotu Yisrael Hu, even, even if he sinned, he is a Yisrael, he is a Yid. He is a Yid, not only means that, that, that he can, that he will be a Yid after he learns to plant film. He is a Yid 100%. Why? Because the Torah and Hashem is engraved in him even when you don't see any of it. If there is no manifestation whatsoever, it is still there. One more step and they'll come at you. And to this, the Torah says, Zois Chukas HaToyva. What does that tell us? It doesn't say Zois Chukas HaPoro. Zeis Chukas HaToy. By using this term, uh, this is the chukah of the Torah, rather than this is the chukah of the Torah. What the Torah is telling us is that in the real truth, the entire Torah and all mitzvahs and the entire spectrum, the entire structure of the Yid and the Yid and Jewish connection to Hashem is of the same category as this Kuh. It is engraved and it is cut into the Jewish soul and you cannot really separate between them. You cannot really separate between them. If we reflect on this, on, on this, it's an interesting thing of, of the phenomenon of our time. When the Rebbe started coming out with the Mifzoyim, with the campaign to bring Eden back to Yiddishkan, at that time, it was the wildest dream that such a thing can happen. It seemed that people were going in the other direction. Not towards, but away. The world was just going to pot. And what was the first mitzvah that the Rebbe came out with? Tefillin. Put on Tefillin. Now, feeling is not Shabbos. You can go to a Yid and say, hey, keep Shabbos or remember Shabbos. After all, if it's such a significant thing, you can relate to it, you can understand it. It will remind you of creation. He didn't talk about Pesach. Remember, you know, we came out of Egypt. Remember, that's a national holiday. Something of the sort that, you, that people in the street can relate to. What did he say? Put on tefillin. Tefillin? I don't know. I know what you want from me. It's like Pora Duma. <laughs> What's tefillin? Take stripes and, and, and wrap it on my round. What do you want? And yet, right? Beyond being amazing, people put on tefillin. 
who have never seen it, never heard about it. Not like one who has put it on when he was a child and he went away. Never. He was never, never, he never saw it. He puts out feel, and all of a sudden he will, he lives up, he, will, he refreshes, he wakes up. He says, wow, this is quite an experience. It's quite an experience. Sometimes they start crying from emotion. Putting on the field. Why is that? Because the field are engraved, are cut into their soul. He immediately relates to it, he doesn't have to understand it. I remember myself walking around with the Esrik and Lula one time. And, so, and, so and there was a group of young kids, young boys, 14, 14, 15, young kids. Russian kids, it so happened. So I offered them to take the, to take the Lulav and the Esrik. Yeah, sure, you take the Lulav and the Esrik, make some broken stuff. Then I go to the next one there. Then the kid comes out, can I do it again? So I said, no, you know, do, do it once a day. So he says, ah, what do you say? Chochi sab toniza. He wants it, you know, you want it, but you're not allowed to. What is he chochi sab? What does he want? Somehow, he wants to hold on to that second no more. Somehow it touches him. How does it touch him? It doesn't touch him through his intellect, to anyone, doesn't remind him of any other experience. It has no meaning to him in his normal life. It's a mitzvah of Torah. It's a chukah. It's a chukah. It's engraved in his soul because Torah and Yidin are one thing. As much as we try to understand and we try to explain mitzvahs of the Torah, we want to understand, we should understand. But in no way are we going to dig down to the point where we understand how the mitzvah really connects to us. You have to try to understand more and more, because you have to try to understand everything. And send Hashem. Bring it out, reveal it. But that's not going to explain how it actually connects with us. As an aside, and this is why it's very important to always remember. I'm not, I'm not finished with the Torah, I just want to always remember that Torah and Mitzvahs, sometimes when we get accustomed to it, we don't feel the effect so much anymore. And, and we kind of lose the excitement and say, eh, it's not so important. We don't, we, we have to always remember whether you feel it or you're not, this is really touching the very soul, the very core of the soul. And while Ayid puts on film every day, and he has a mezuzah at his door, and whatever other mitzvahs, tzitzis, whatever other mitzvah he can do, <coughs> he lives a different life, and he doesn't know where it's coming from. There's a different spirit, a different inspiration. He thinks differently, he feels differently, he appreciates things differently. His heart and mind are open up differently. Because it's, it comes right from the from the <coughs> from the hookah of the nation. Yes. Any question? And this now is really the, the point which I want to focus in. And um, identify clearly 
the purpose and the function of what we are trying to accomplish in Yeshiva. How this is going to prepare us for our life. You learn in Yeshiva, I always speak about this, you learn in Yeshiva and you work hard, hopefully you work hard, And, okay, so you learn this page and that page and this page, but how is that, what is that, how is that take me out, how does that prepare me for, for my, the rest of my life? What do I know now that makes it possible for me to go and, and do something in the world? The answer is, there is something much more important than learning what to do and how to act. It says, Rosh Hashanah it says, it says that Rosh Hashanah is the time when we accept Hashem's rulership, Hashem's kingdom. And the mother says that Rosh Hashanah is like, like a king where the people come to the king and they, they want to coronate him and they say to him, we want you to give us direction, give us mitzvahs, give us rules. So the king says to them, Kablo Malchusi Kablo First accept my rulership, my reign, accept me as a king, and then I will give you I will give you Xavis. Then I'll give you Xavis. What does it mean you accept as a king? How do you accept a king except by by fulfilling his his um, commands? Accepting a king in, in Torah terms means that one recognizes that he has a place where he belongs. This is not what's called a hefker. This is not an open desert, an open jungle. And in order to relate to Torah, one has to recognize that in Torah, before you understand Torah, there is a chukko of Torah. Chukko of Torah means <coughs> that there is a boundary that's cut right through and through the soul. When you come to learn Torah, so you say, look, it's not the first time I'm learning. I'm, I'm an adult, and I've learned, I've studied all kinds of different studies. I'm a mathematician. I'm a scientist. I'm a physicist. I'm a doctor. I learned many things. Why can't I learn Torah the same way as I learn medicine? Or anything else? They say, no, there's, it's not the same learning whatsoever. When you learn medicine or physics or anything else, you and the subject that you're learning are two separate things. You know about it. You know about it. You don't have to become it. And how do you know what, what makes you know it? Because you have proofs. You have physical proofs. 
mathematical proofs of certain of certain uh, of certain theories. That's how you know. You don't have a personal knowledge of it, a personal relationship to it. When you come to learn Torah, Torah has to be learned with your very soul. When we say, Bresh is born on Kim Zashamayim, there's always, you say, Hashem created Zashamayim, we're always. We're not, this is not an academic message. This is what it says in the Torah, Hashem created Zashamayim, we're always. No, it's a personal message. After having learned that, now I look at the world differently. It's not the same world to me. Not from the Torah perspective. Oh, that's how the Torah believes it. You can, no, this is the way, I, this is mine. This is Torah and me is one thing. And if I learn, the Torah is telling me, revealing within my own soul this recognition that this is not just a world. It's a different kind of world than I thought of before. And the same thing, same goes for every other thing that we learn. When you say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Akin, Hashem Echod, we are not just saying the words and we believe the idea, but this is something which we live with. This actually represents our own thinking. Because the Torah, Chukas the Torah itself, the whole Torah, and every aspect of the Torah, is engraved and cut into our soul is one thing with our soul. There's no other way for us to see it truly. If we should feel comfortable, so to speak, through our, see it through our soul, except for the, with, the, with the perspective the way the Torah presents it. This is the meaning of Kabla Malchus. This is where Ayid and Hashem becomes one. This is when Ayid and the Torah become one. With this, Ayid can go out any place in the world, under any circumstances. He's still not at a loss. Not at a loss. He's not, he doesn't know what world am I in. Wherever he is, he knows which world he's on. He's in. You cannot throw a surprise on him. Because it's the same world that Hashem created. No matter where it is. Any differences are all superficial. The essence of it is exactly the same. This is the aim. This is what we want to get here. Both the strength but more importantly, the insight. We have to, the Torah has to pry open our mind, open our mind and open our heart, so that we, we begin to think with our real intellect, not with, 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 with um, a superficial and external view of things. To think the way the way I know thinks. This is what this learning is about. If if one goes through a day of learning and he wants to give himself a husband and reckoning, what did I do today? He should only reflect how he thought about Torah and Yiddishkeit and about the world yesterday and how he thinks about it today. Then he will see what he had, what he had accomplished. Going through another day of learning Torah, learning Chesidus, and experiencing and living a Torah life definitely brings a different depth and different clarity 
and touches the person a little bit more deeply, cuts a little more deeply into his, into his psyche, into his personality, refines him, brings out more truth in him. That's his accomplishment. Hashem should help each one of us. That we should from day to day, from week to week, from month to month, see how we are growing in this, in this spirit, in this insight, in this truth become more and more <coughs> united with the Torah, united with Yiddishkeit. That we should really begin to sense that Yiddishkeit is engraved, is cut right into, into me. It's no longer a question, should I or should I not? This is me. A Yid with Yiddishkeit is inseparable. Not something that I have to make a choice in. This is me. And thus, if this is me, like we said before, this highest, this comes from Hashem directly. Hashem, Hashem's highest, this is infinite and eternal, and therefore we become connected to internal life. And we are not vulnerable to, any, to anything. We go into the world and fulfill our task, fulfill our mission in life, and we bring light into the whole world. And ultimately, we bring the Shia for everyone. Lachai.